Okay guys, hey, sorry about that. Looks like this will be a two video installment. I accidentally uh, pushed down on my arrow key thinking I was on the PowerPoint, but I was on the video, so it stopped it. Um, okay, so there will be two videos up in regards to Roman art, a quick little five minute intro, and now into the more emphasized point. So again, like I mentioned, the art is emphasizing public use. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. During uh, during this time, so again, focusing on something more practical and less idealistic. So we saw idealism with human with humanism increasing during the Greek period, kind of showing remember that their ideal idyllic uh, concept is that humans have godlike powers and strength and also the gods meaning like these demigods or this polytheistic idea of each element is governed by a said uh, demigod or uh, or god uh, lowercase g so to speak uh, in regards to polytheism and um that those demigods actually are weak they can be weakened like humans so kind of elevating humans to this idealistic godlike presence and then taking these gods and and uh, and uh, um, what's the best word uh, downgrading their status to more like human status okay but with the Romans, they're very practical and they're less interested in all of that uh, element of divinity and the metaphysical concepts and the spiritual concepts. And they're more interested in the day-to-day -day civilian and civil tea and the usage during that civil tea. So um, the first piece that we look at is the bust of Emperor Vespasian. And again, you'll see with this, there's a high degree of individuality. So instead of making the individual look idealistic and portraying them in an ideal pattern, like you also we also saw with the Egyptians in the tomb of Tutankhamun, the funerary mask was idealized for the individual, uh, the child pharaoh that was buried there. Um, not truly depicting the natural look of the child or the natural look of Tutankhamun, more of an idealistic approach, and that's what the Greeks did as well. But with the Romans, they're interested more in a high degree of individuality, and they want to record the imperfections of the character or the imperfections of the person. All right, and we'll see that um, in the image of, um, of Vespasian. All right, you can see the rolls in the forehead, the drooping skin over the eyes, the chubbier cheeks, um, the, the folds of the, the thicker skin around the neck of the, uh, of the bust. So you can see that high degree of individuality and um, the use of the, the true natural look of the individual and showing those imperfections. Um, some of the greatest achievements that the Romans had were civil engineering, town planning, and architecture. All right, so you'll really see with architecture in particular how advanced they were. Um, we looked in the architecture PowerPoint and the aqueducts that you see that was there in France, uh, those were built by the Romans, okay, because they ran that area of Western Europe, all right, during the empire. And those aqueducts is, uh, it's, it's an arcade, all right? So if you remember, an arcade is a, um, it's a post system with um, a round arch, uh, lintel, lintel system on top of the post, right? So that's what an arcade is, and it's linear, so it goes, it doesn't curve or anything like that. But what they will do is they'll start using this concept of the rounded arch on top of the on top of the columns and 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 curve them like uh, like a barrel, right? And then that's what creates the Colosseum, all right? And it also is what helps makes a dome roof, which we'll see with the Pantheon, not the Parthenon. So remember, the Parthenon is seen in Athens, Greece, and then the Parthenon, I mean, sorry, the Pantheon is seen in Rome, all right, in Italy during the Roman Empire. Okay, so looking at the image of uh, Vis uh, Vespasian, so take a look at that. And again, using the round arch feature, um, and this was allowing them to build those arcades that I just talked about with the aqueducts, 
using barrel vaults. All right, we'll see the barrel vaults usage in the Colosseum as well as used in the uh, dome roof of the uh, Pantheon. Okay. So the Colosseum is actually what's called a public works. So it's a place where the individuals of society go and are entertained. So having a place where it's maintained by the empire, but it gives uh, the citizens of the area uh, in Rome a place to, and then outside of Rome, they all come in for entertainment. And uh, this was a uh, called a the... Flavian Amphitheater. It's a Flavian Amphitheater. And it's a three-story round arch colonnade. So if you remember what a colonnade is, it's a post and then a flat uh, lintel, right? And it creates typically a rectilinear structure. But in this case, it's rounded. So it's a three-story round arch colonnade. So it's the idea of that arcade but it's rounded and it's bent and it goes all the way in a full circle. And there's an image of the Colosseum. Some of you might have actually seen the Colosseum in person. Um, if you have, that's great. Um, so this is a technically kind of a, a different architectural order that's being developed. This concept of a linear construction being bent and having this, um, this rounded arch on top of the columns uh, being a 360 circle versus um, all the way, or instead of it being linear from side to side. Um, and, it, the, you know, the Colosseum is meant for amusement, such as gladiator fights and matches, and also game hunts, all contained within the confines of the Colosseum. Okay? And you can see it. Uh, uh, figure 1610 is part of the amphitheater style. Okay? So, um, now I'm not sure... And I don't want to be mistaken, but I'm not quite sure if it goes all the way around. An amphitheater, Flavian amphitheater, denotes the idea that there is some open space where there's not a wall that goes all the way around. So that the seating um, is, is designed in a way to get good acoustics so that you can hear. Um, so I'm not quite sure if it went all the way around. I think it went mostly all the way around, uh, but not quite. Okay. So again, an amphitheater is the idea you sit up high, you view down low, and then because of the way it's set up, the acoustics or the Doppler effect or the echo effect moves up into the seating and it allows you to hear even if you're in the very top of the Colosseum on the third row. Okay. And then, um, then we have the Pantheon. All right, The Pantheon is another uh, public works project and it's a temple in this case. So it's a place of worship, right? It's a major temple to all the gods, all right, kept by, dom, by, the, by a dome. So the Roman Empire at this time was pre-Constantine, pre-Byzantine, was uh, uh, polytheistic as well, uh, not monotheistic. So the Greeks and the Romans uh, during the Greek and Roman empires were polytheistic, so they believed in multiple gods, all right? They believed in what are called demigods. And the Pantheon is a structure, a temple, uh, for, excuse me, for the gods, for the demigods. It had a single entrance frame by a columned porch called a portico, all right? Um, and then it has recessed squares called coffers, Okay, so those recessed squares, those coffers, are where the statues of the demigods are placed. All right, like a little niche in the wall. It's called a coffer. And then it has an oculus, meaning an opening in the ceiling. And then what happens is the sun comes in and it shines through that oculus. All right, it's completely open, so it rains in. They, they have plumbing and guttering system inside of the Pantheon where when it rains in, it just filters into, uh, into the, the sides of the stonework and then it goes outside. So their plumbing system was um, incredible and very much ahead of, its, uh, ahead of their time, so to speak, um, in comparison to anywhere else in the world. But the sun would come in and through the oculus and then it would shine upon 
one of the demigods in the coffers, all right, emphasizing that that god at that time during that time of year. So depending on how the sun rose, it would uh, illuminate uh, certain gods uh, throughout the that season, all right? So that's what the oculus is. So if you look at figure 1611a, you can see the domed roof, all right? And remember, with a dome roof, all of the weight of that dome is distributed down in the, on the cylinder, um, one, 360 degrees all the way down, okay? And um, if you remember back in the architectural section, there's also what's called a, a, the, uh, the pentatives that are used, which are five areas that distribute the weight of the dome down. But in this case, it's a full cylinder, a full circular cylinder that distributes the weight equally all the way down, all right? You can see uh, an, um, uh, um, uh, the derivative Greek um, colonnade system in the front, the entrance, all right? So it has the, the pediment and the frieze, okay? So you have the columns, and then you have what look like I, uh, Corinthian columns, and then you have the frieze above the columns. And then above the frieze, the triangulation is what's called the, uh, the, the uh, pediment. Okay, the pediment. So that's the rectangular, the triangular part is called the pediment. And then behind that kind of Greek der derived entryway, you have the, uh, the cylinder that builds the structure of the Pantheon and then the dome that's on top. Okay. And then if you look at the, the plan the diagram, you can see the profile, the one on the bottom, shows you the oculus in the center, and that's where the sun will come down. It's a perfect circle on the inside. And then the top diagram is an aerial diagram, and all the little white uh, recessions in the black outline, those are the coffers. So those are where the demigods, statues, would be placed inside the pantheon. Remember, that's a temple. And then there's a painting of the interior of the Pantheon. And you can see where the oculus is on the very top and how it's shining down, um, hot, getting ready to highlight um, one of the gods that's in one of the coffers inside of the Pantheon. Okay. So not a lot of painting um, seen during the Roman Empire. A lot of it was a very sculptural Based, uh, but do know that these sculptural pieces were painted, all right? Uh, many of them were painted, so there was color on top of all of these sculptures. Same with the Greeks. So when you look at the Parthenon, um, for example, it was colored. It had paint all over it. It was very brightly colored, but that paint has just worn away and weathered over time, but the stones have not. Um, so many of the sculptures that we see have been painted have been painted, but it, they look drab and not um, not very bright because time and weathering has removed all the paint from the surface of those pieces, okay? But there were some paintings that were found internally, and the paintings would show like love of luxury because obviously the empire was very rich because it had gone and taken uh, many things from other parts of the world. Uh, many precious items and um, was building its wealth based off of it being the empire of the Western world. Um, this painting in particular, it survived from Pompeii, um, Herculaneum, um, and it's a, a depiction of one from a villa near Naples, and you can see that it's a complex urban scene. It shows starting to show perspective, all right? So we're starting to see that linear perspective start to develop versus before it was very flat and there wasn't much spatial depth like we saw with the Greeks or uh, well kind of with the Greeks not a lot of paintings with the Greeks uh, mostly on the pottery remember during the arch archaic period but definitely there was no spatial depth and also there was no spatial depth during the Egyptian period either but during this Hellenistic period um, with the Romans with this uh, painting depiction, you can really start to see perspective. Um, and then after the collapse of the Roman Empire, representation of third dimension ceased to be of an interest. And you'll see that whenever you look at the early Christian 
um, art as well as uh, some of the Byzantine art, you're going to start to see um, the removal of depth and the removal of spatial depth and the uh, complexities of perspective. All right, it becomes flat again and more uh, representational and less uh, less true to uh, mathematical nature. Okay, so if you look at Figure sixteen thirteen, there's the Roman painting um, and it's the bedroom from the villa, and um, you can start to see the perspective and the way that the buildings have that linear perspective as if they're going back towards some kind of implied vanishing point. Okay, so. Uh, very architectural, very practical, very conventional, very focused on civility, very focused on public works, and even the paintings start to depict that as well, right? So this is the second video. You'll have two videos. I'll send you an email in regards to the questions that I'm going to ask you about early Christianity art as well as Byzantine and medieval and that will be your requirement, and then we'll get uh, going with Renaissance for the next class. Okay, guys, um, I'll talk to you soon, and I hope you're doing well. Take care.